dozen K-9 police units from the NYPD, State Police, and Suffolk County Police are continuing to forage certain sections of Manorville's 6,900-acre Pine Barrens, more than 20 years after the partial remains of Gilgo Beach victims Jessica Taylor and Valerie Mack were found in the underbrush. Manhattan architect Rex Hewerman, whose home is in Massapequa Park, has been charged in four other Gilgo Beach murder cases and has pleaded not guilty. You're listening to the latest on NBC News Radio. NBC News Radio, I'm Lisa Taylor. Former President Trump is back in a New York City court for his criminal hush money trial. Jurors are once again hearing testimony from former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker, who gave details this week on how he protected Trump from negative stories leading up to the 2016 presidential election. It comes as the judge in the case said he'll consider four other Trump gag order violations being alleged by the prosecution. Trump faces felony charges of falsifying business records to cover up payments to adult film actress Stormy Daniels to keep her quiet about an alleged affair. It's up to state governors to decide if the National Guard is needed to subdue pro-Palestine protests on college campuses. That's according to the Biden administration. House Speaker Mike Johnson called on President Biden to call in the National Guard after visiting Columbia University Wednesday. The speaker said there is an appropriate time for the National Guard. White House spokesperson Karine Jean-Pierre told reporters Thursday calling in the National Guard is something for governors to decide. Lisa Taylor, NBC News Radio. One of the best ways to build a healthier local economy is by shopping locally. Teamster Advantage is a shop local program started by Teamster Local 1932 that has brought together hundreds of locally owned businesses to provide discounts for residents who make shopping locally their priority. Everything from restaurants like Corky's to fun times at SB Raceway and much, much more. If you're not currently a Teamster and you want access to these local business discounts, contact Jennifer at 909-889-8377, extension 224. Give her a call. That number again is 909-889-8377, extension 224. What would you do if you had a broken bone? You'd go to the doctor and use your insurance, right? Well, what would you do if you have a serious problem with drugs and alcohol? Most people do nothing until it's way too late. Your insurance can help you get clean and sober with the assistance of a place like the Detox and Treatment Helpline. Many times, addiction treatment is fully covered. So why not use your insurance to treat your addiction problem just like you would if you had a broken bone? And with the Family Medical Leave Act, you're allowed to take time off by law, and your employer doesn't need to know the reason. So there are two good reasons. You've got insurance you can use for your addiction problem, and with the Family Medical Leave Act, it's completely confidential. Call now, 800-398-7414. That's 800-398-7414. The Village Mud wants to remind pet owners of the importance of spaying and neutering. Shelters overflow with unwanted pets. Spaying and neutering helps prevent this and has many health benefits too. That message courtesy of the Village Mud at 665 East Foothill Boulevard in Claremont. For self-serve pet wash tubs and high-end food and treats for dogs and cats featuring natural and raw. Call the Village Mud 909-624-3020 and like them on Facebook. Life is challenging and ever-changing. Take control with passive income through real estate investing. Learn how. Learn now. Let Dell Wamsley and Lifestyles Unlimited's investors and mentors show you. Meet Dell's team live in Anaheim two days only at the Sheraton Park Hotel at Anaheim Resort. Saturday and Sunday, May 4th and 5th. Register now at GiveMeTotalFreedom.com. That's GiveMeTotalFreedom.com. Enter promo code 2024 for a special discount offer. GiveMeTotalFreedom.com. Code 2024. NBC News on KCAA Loma Linda, sponsored by Teamsters Local 1932, protecting the future of working families, Teamsters1932.org. It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. 
Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Uh, file this under Joe Biden did that. Uh, starting July 1st, uh, the overtime threshold uh, for exemption will be 43888 bucks, up from the current 35568 bucks. And starting January 1st, that number will jump again up to 58656 bucks, uh, covering, well, about 4 million more workers in, in the new year. Uh, with with better wages, and you know these are going to help you know people who uh, you know, have been given titles, uh, and I lo I love this argument because I remember it during the Obama years really well, because it, most people hadn't really thought about this overtime threshold. You know that's a working class thing, and I'm going no no this is a worker thing. Uh, if you punch the clock for a living, if you do work for someone else, this should be important to you. Because if they gave you a cute little title with a little little, little gold-plated thing with your name on it, assistant manager underneath, and at the time paid you twenty six six a year, uh, they could work you 100 hours a week. Yeah, you know, and, you know, works out to be less than minimum wage, obviously. But, hey, you're management because you're now exempt. Because you have some kind of official role uh, where once in a while they make you tell some other worker what to do. So you're now exempt from all of this. And, you know, during the Obama years, they wanted to boost it up to 47,000. And, of course, Republicans lost their mind. Uh, Donald Trump came in and, and they said, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to drop that Obama thing down. But we can't look like total tyrants. So they bumped it up to 35.5. And it's it's been stuck there since the early Trump years, even though inflation has gone up, uh, as my 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 red hat friends love to remind me. Uh, so this is Biden going, hey, um, in order to uh, to be exempt from minimum wage, you got to pay above this threshold. Now, again, these arguments are, are you know, digging back into the archives. Uh, does it mean that you know you're going to have to pay a worker fifty eight thousand six hundred and fifty six bucks a year uh, to have them work for you? It means you have to pay them fifty eight thousand six hundred fifty six bucks if you want to exempt them from overtime. If you want them to work forty one hours and that one hour after forty you don't want to pay overtime for, bang, that's what you got to pay. It doesn't mean that you can't, you know, pay them fifty-eight thousand six hundred fifty-six bucks an hour and work them a hundred hours a week, uh, and then have to pay overtime. No, you can work them as much as you want if you pay that threshold, um, that that number. That's simple. This is not a mandate that you have to. It does mean though that you have to respect your workers' time. It doesn't mean you can set up your business model on, you know, if I can just work these people more. Uh, if I could just work them till they burn out and leave and I can get the next person to come in and work them out till they burn out. Uh, this is saying, look, you know, 40 hours a week. After that, you pay time and a half. That's the law of the land. And what's happened over the, you know, the last you know, 50 years is that's been able to, to be eroded away. And it's one of those things that, you know, most working people, oh, they're management. No, these are, these are working people who are just given a nice title most of the time. Executive assistant, one of my favorite. I don't know what it means, but you're an executive assistant uh, and you are now exempt from overtime because they said so. Because I guess the word ex executive is in there. Uh, and this is a big thing. Um, but it's another one of those little things that this administration has moved forward on that will actually help working people. It's actually going to bring the wages up. Yesterday, we talked about the non-competes that uh, the, the, uh, the the Federal Trade or the, the, the Department of Labor undid uh, and the Federal Trade Commission did away with. These, these non-competes um, that said, hey, you know, uh, peanut butter and jelly is proprietary. Uh, you can't go work across the street and flip burgers. Something in the wrist we've taught you. You, we, you can't take that anywhere. It's all of these little things adding up to returning a reward to work. The fact that, you know, 4 million workers are going to are gonna see an increase in wages or have more time in their life to do other things. 
the fact that millions of workers who are subjected to these non-competes are now going to be able to go, hey, uh, I can go out into the market and, and, and test my wares. I wish they would do this for the, ar the forced arbitration clauses. I wish they would do undo some of the really bad stuff that's happened over the last, the last 50 years as well. But ultimately, what this is doing is it's moving us in this direction where we are returning reward to work. And it's the thing I ask out of every president that I've ever voted for. All I want is you to be the guy who returns reward to work. Brings that brings back that moment of, of, of I believe in work hard, play by the rules, get ahead. And, you know, for for 40 plus years, and we've been talking about this nonstop, you know, wages have been stagnant and declining. And it's only now after the pandemic when inflation spiked because corporations are gouging us, have we now realized, uh-oh, we're struggling. Now, what the right has done masterfully is they've given people the red meat. The red meat is all Joe Biden's fault. Never mind all of the bad policies from Reagan forward. Never mind all of the neoliberalism and all the deregulation and all the allowing of monopolies to grow and, and, and all of that. Never mind that. It's Joe Biden's fault. Evidently, didn't know there's a switch under a drawer that, you know, every president knows it's there. It's the inflation. It's, it's the cause pain button. And Biden, he's the guy who did it, evidently. Uh, this, this uh, again, news to me, uh, but I'll tell you, uh, I am thrilled with the stuff that's coming out of this administration. And as working people, we should want more of it. Say, yes, please. Thank you. Yes, please. More, please. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. We'll going to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, more on what we should be doing. More on how we reclaim our economy. Back after this. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Saving work in America, one show at a time. The Rick Smith Show. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So, ran into a red hat today who yelled, had to yell at me, let's go, Brandon. And, and I got to be honest, I, I was feeling a little jaunty today, feeling a little little uh, ready to engage in some, some verbal combat. And I said, yeah. Uh, let's go. Uh, let's go and reshore manufacturing. And yeah, let's go and re reinvest in our infrastructure. And yes, let's go and save labor law and return re reward to work. Yeah, let's go. Let's go after corporations who have been gouging us. Let's go after ending neoliberalism. Yeah, you're, you're right. Let's go, Brandon. Poor guy didn't know what to say. Turned, walked away, head down. And this is what we've got to do to these folks. We've got to point out reality in this world of misinformation and disinformation where the red hats have been feeding themselves with a bunch of nonsense and hit them with things that are actually getting done and good stuff that is actually getting done and that's that's why i've asked bill Badoon to come talk with us bill al is the director of policy and research at the groundwork collaborative one of my favorite groups doing incredible work out there bill thanks for taking time for us such a pleasure to join you. Thanks for having me. So, you know, look, I, I get this all the time. I get people, you know, Bidenomics is killing us. And it's all Joe Biden's fault. Everything is Biden's fault. When the reality is it's corporate America has been sticking it to us, not just since the pandemic, but for the past 40, 50 years. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, look, Americans are being gouged, ripped off, tricked, uh, uh, defrauded even um, uh, all across uh, sort of uh, product categories. I mean, 
um, you know, the, the floodgates really are open, uh, particularly after the pandemic, when we had this, this bout of inflation that was very difficult for families. But at the same time, it provided cover for a lot of corporations to pursue tactics that in previous decades were considered unthinkable, um, especially uh, when it comes to raising prices on folks. And so um, I think it's important now for everybody to wake up to this reality and realize that corporations are simply too powerful in this country. Yeah, I mean, the greedy the greedy marriage of, of greedflation and, and shrinkflation, harming families, and, and you can't walk away from that. But, you know, the sad reality is they've got an easy sca- scapegoat because it's all, it's easy to go, it's Biden's fault, it's Bidenomics, it's, it's let's go Brandon. And when you go without the reality of going, no, 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 it's it's the greedy corporations, the guy you don't see in the white shirt sitting in the corner offer, office going, hey, how do I I line my pockets at the expense of everybody else. Uh, that's exactly right. In some cases, it's even easier than that. Sometimes it's uh, uh, an algorithm that's just used to uh, to, to calculate, you know, the, the max price that uh, that a company should charge you. Um, sometimes it's you know software that's deciding how much rent you should pay or or the cost of uh, the beef that you pick up from the supermarket. It's gotten awfully easy to rip people off in this country, and I think we have to start rolling that back. Now, now I saw something like this that came out of the Federal Trade Commission not too long ago on this ag- algorithmic pricing uh, in the rental market, I think it was, uh, where That's they were right. saying, you know, this is unfair competition. Even if two you know, sets of landlords aren't directly talking to each other by using this algorithm, they kind of are. That's exactly right. I mean, look. I think folks understand intuitively that uh, if you're a landlord and there's a landlord across the street and the two of you meet up for a barbecue and decide, you know what, we're going to raise prices on this block, that is collusion. Uh, Now, if you do that via an algorithm, it's still collusion and collusion is illegal. And so I think that's the message that the FTC put out, not just in uh, housing, but also in, in, um, you know, with meat, with meat processing firms and other firms as well. And so um, there's no hiding behind an algorithm. Uh, And uh, thankfully, we do have a Federal Trade Commission uh, that has revived antitrust in a way uh, to, to really, um, you know, be our, be the American people's eyes and ears uh, when it comes to some of these uh, tricks and, and, and deceptive practices. But again, you know, I look at housing and the fact that rents have gone up so high. Everybody I talk to saying that they're getting gouged for rent. And look, there's there's not much they can do about it because where are you going to go? It seems like they've all done it and they've all done it at about the same rate. So that idea that, hey, I'll go I'll go across the street, I'll go across town where it might be cheaper. That doesn't seem to exist. Is that, do you think, because of this algorithm? I mean, it, it, it's certainly part of it. I mean, it, you know, if, if you don't like a, a rent price, you should be able to Pick, pick yourself up and say, I'm going somewhere else. I'm going to go to this other neighborhood. But if all the landlords are using the same algorithm to determine the prices, the maximum price that you'll pay, and they determine those prices using uh, information and inputs that you don't have access to, then you're always going to be on your heels and you're always going to be at a disadvantage. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's, it's really a form of collusion that uh, we have to put an end to. Because it's all of this stuff. You know, I mean, the reality is, as I was told, you know, 100 years ago when I was in college, that the free market was, uh, you know, about competition and that to be part of a free market, you would have the ability to abstain from that, from purchasing it or not purchasing it or purchase from somewhere else. The sad reality, you look at housing, you don't really have much of a choice. You need it. And if all of the inputs and all of the, uh, the, the things that you are looking at are, well, not competing, I, that's that's not the free market. No, it's not. No, it's not. And in fact, um, we suffer from a lack of competition throughout the economy. Uh, corporations are too powerful. They don't face competition, um, certainly not like they used to. About 75% of U.S. industries today are dominated by fewer players than they were 20 years ago. And so what we're seeing today is, you know, the sort of confluence of immense market power, immense uh, lobbying power, um, but also technological changes that give that power additional tools that are more powerful and more harmful. Um, and so it's important for regulators and Congress and really all uh, people of conscience to to stand up and say, uh, you know, enough. You know, I, I you know I was talking about this earlier today with someone about our labor laws. And you go, you the, the majority of our labor laws were written in the 1930s, nearly 100 years ago. Um, a lot of these rules that we're talking about, kind of the same scenario. It seems like most of the, the legislation and the laws that we're living in uh, that are we're, we're supposed to help with competition and save capitalism are, are decades old. Uh, and no one could have ever imagined that a computer would be able to, you know, be the, the middleman between everyone to set the price. 
Uh, is this a, a place where we need to start updating some of our laws and, and, and answer it? I mean, the Federal Trade Commission, you know, the laws that they operate under, how old are those? Absolutely. I mean, things like the Sherman Antitrust Act, I mean, th these go way back. But I think what the FTC has done a really good job of is simply applying those uh, older standards to more modern situations, you know, and, and saying, if you use an algorithm, that's no different than you using a human agent uh, to sort of be the middleman to help you collude on prices. And so it, it's really just, you know, taking those principles and making sure we're applying them correctly. And at the same time, we do need new laws. That's why you know, interventions like uh, Senator Bob Casey has a Shrinkflation Prevention Act uh, to uh, classify practices like shrinkflation, which, by the way, is the practice when you shrink the size of a product without lowering its price, and it's a, it's, it's a sort of deceptive practice. Uh, that bill seeks to classify it as a deceptive practice and therefore uh, deem it illegal. And so those newer interventions are, are really important. Uh, similarly, Senator Elizabeth Warren has uh, a bill called the Price Gouging uh, Prevention Act, um, and what that would do is uh, it would uh, really disincentivize companies from using the, the cover of these economic emergencies like the pandemic, which was really painful for, for people, like inflation, uh, like natural disasters, and, and to not use the cover of those events uh, to arbitrarily jack up prices and keep them high. Um, and so, you know, it, it's going to be a combination of both. And, and thankfully, we are seeing uh, progress on both fronts. What do you say to the argument that we live in a capitalist country, Bilal, and, you know, you know the, the manufacturers, the producers can charge whatever they want. It's the consumer's choice to whether whether to purchase them or not. Because you know, I've argued, look, if the price of eggs is too much, don't buy them. And that's how you bring the price down. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there something, is there a way the consumer can go, you know what, we're, we're done uh, until you start treating us fairly? Or do you not see that as something possible in this day and age? Look, I'm old enough to remember when, you know, companies had to compete for my business, uh, had to innovate, had to invent, uh, had to, um, you know, uh, you know, had to f find all of these ways to, to, to really uh, signal to consumers that, hey, you should buy my product. That's not what's happening today. Um, today, it's, it's the using the muscle of market dominance to strong arm consumers into paying higher prices and extracting profits uh, as a result. And so, Look, do, do corp should corporations be able to pursue profits? Of course, and they do. Um, but should corporations be able to price gouge people? No. Uh, I think all of your listeners know intuitively that if you know if you're in the middle of a hurricane and uh, there's somebody on the corner uh, on the corner selling water bottles for twenty dollars a bottle, that is wrong. There's nothing free about that. Uh, that is exploitation, and exploitation is wrong, and in many cases, it's illegal. So the question I, I keep coming back to is, how did we get here? I mean, I have a, I have a theory of how we ended up in this situation where uh, we've got a handful of corporations that control industry after industry, and you know the the power that they have to hold down wages, uh, to to increase prices, to do all of the things that that you know, I, I think the average person would find uh, you know deplorable. Uh, how did we get to this point? You know, what what allowed this to happen over all of these years to where because I, I like you, I'm old enough to remember where there were multiple companies who were fighting for your business and they would they would. Hey, we're going to give you 20 cents off this week or a buck off or, hey, we got this bonus. There was always something. It seems like, well, not so much. Right. I mean, as you mentioned, with uh, neoliberalism, uh, we're hopefully emerging out of this this half a century consensus of not regulating uh, corporations, not taxing corporations, um, really allowing corporations to, 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 to do whatever they want. Um, and what we found is, you know, towards the end of that period, once uh, corporations, you know, offshore, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, outsourced jobs, uh, once they uh, began to evade taxes, um, once they cut costs to, really to the bone, um, there's nothing left to cut. And so now, the only thing they could do to satisfy Wall Street and satisfy uh, their shareholders is to jack up prices. Yeah. And so that's where we are. Now, the difference in why this moment is particularly dangerous is um, because they're not just raising their sticker prices. Uh, they're using new technology to raise prices in such a way that, you know, something something really central that we all take for granted, uh, that we will know what things cost before we pay for them, uh, that that might be dissipating in this country. And so we have to really... Uh, preserve that basic fairness that, you know, you and I, Rick, uh, should not have to pay a different price for the same product, you know, based on our browsing history, based on, uh, you know, how low our battery is, which is something Uber was accused of doing. Uh, you know, so th this is just uh, simply a combination of 
of market power run amok, uh, of less competition, of low taxation, uh, and ultimately of a, a once in a century opportunity, which the pandemic was, to deploy some really predatory tactics that were previously thought to be unthinkable. I remember the, the the low battery thing, and you go, you can't you can't make that up. You couldn't dream that up uh, to make that reality. And you know, look, I look at concert tickets. You know, I, I remember a day where you could go to the box office and you could buy it for what the ticket said. Uh, now, good luck finding a box office, and everything is on you know one of the the big apps. Uh, and then the the fees that they charge, the the incredible amount of fees uh, for for doing literally nothing. Is what's the yeah. convenience fees and the service fees and the fees for fees for fees it's crazy which is why i'm glad you know biden and them are saying look these junk fees that they keep adding on to everything that's got to stop absolutely absolutely it's got to stop you know when you put your uh you know when you go on uber eats uh, and you order a cheeseburger it says one price when you start that process and then lo and behold the moment you go to check out and pay the price changes and it goes up when you're filing for your taxes, you might use TurboTax. You know, in the beginning, it's advertised as a free service. And, you know, you're 45 minutes into entering all your income and all these complicated documents. And of course, you have to upgrade to the deluxe version to continue. So look, this is just uh, deception. Yeah. And um, thankfully, uh, many of our regulatory agencies have recognized it as such. Uh, but I should also, I really want to point out why, uh, an additional reason why these practices are dangerous. Uh, we simply don't have access to the same information that these firms do when they're setting prices. Uh, and so it's simply unfair that these firms know so much about us. We know very little about them. And that asymmetry of information uh, really puts us, uh, really puts them uh, in an advantaged position. No, I mean, the, our, our data, you know, the fact that, you know, they, corporate America knows so much about all of us and that we don't even know what they know about us, which is the part that I, I find scariest of all. Uh, that's something that I've been talking about for years, that we're so far behind the curve uh, on the on you know, probably the rest of the world, but uh, so far behind the curve uh, that we're I don't know that we ever we ever get out of it. Yeah, look, we we uh, we have to regulate these th these big companies. And, and, and you know, I, I think part of the problem is the incentive to price gouge is so big. And the reason why it's so big is because companies know that they're going to keep more of the profits if they pursue a lot of these predatory tactics. Yeah. And, and so this is really where low taxation, for example, comes in. Um, again, if you know that you're going to be able to keep uh, more of the spoils, uh, you're going to pursue those profits more aggressively and in more harmful ways than you otherwise would. And so I, I think, look, we're, we're coming upon uh, a tax fight in 2025, uh, and we should really be thinking about how the tax code uh, could be used to shape corporate behavior and to restore fairness to our economy. No, because we were told and the, the, what we were sold on was if we give corporations all of these tax breaks, uh, that they would then create jobs and we would get those jobs and then they would trickle down in, in higher wages and all kinds of stuff. And that that has not happened. Uh, what has happened is their profits have gone by, gone through the roof, and oh, but stock buybacks keep keep going up, and you know, CEO salary keeps going up, and and the wealthy. We've got a billionaire class richer than ever in the history of humanity, and it's still still not enough. It's still not enough, and it'll never be enough, and and that's really why rules are important. Uh, and I think when you sort of cut corporate taxes, when you cut regulations, you're basically saying there's no referee, there are no rules. And you're free to run roughshod over the American people. And uh, that's really why we're in the position that we're in today yeah. with an affordability crisis, why people can't afford homes. Um, you know, and, and so we have to really uh, address these practices head on. So last question I've got for you. What do we do? What do average everyday Americans do? Um, you know, I know voting is a huge part of this. You know, the, I know November is coming. I, I fear uh, the potential of, of a return of the orange menace. Uh, but what what do people do in this situation? Because I know a lot of people feel helpless, uh, you know, because these corporations are so big, so powerful. Um, what what do we do? People have to first understand that we are uh, the economy, that the economy goes as far as we take it. And the we here is everyone. Um, it's, it's, it's our workers. It's our families. Um, and it's not corporations who create uh, all the value in, in, in our economy. So I think just starting with that basic point, um, that really dignifying point that we are the economy uh, and, and call your representatives and say, I'm tired of being ripped off. 
I'm tired of be being ripped off at the grocery store. I'm tired of being ripped off on my car insurance, uh, on my tax filing. Uh, there are so many uh, opportunities for corporations to rip us off. And uh, we do have the tools, whether it's antitrust, whether it's taxation, or uh, whether it's new legislation, as we've seen. We do have the tools uh, to rein this in, and it's not a foregone conclusion that we will be susceptible to corporate profiteering uh, and predatory practices. Uh, we could change this, and I and, and I think we need to uh, we need to act like it. I, I know I said last question, a line of question, but you know this follows up on that. Uh, do you think the Biden administration is moving in that direction? Do you think the Lena Khans and the Jonathan Cantors? Do you think the people who he's put into place uh, has done? Some of this is moving us in the right direction. And and I, I want to get your thoughts on what you think a return of Trump would do uh, to any of this stuff. Look, I, I think those agencies you, you mentioned have done an excellent job. I would also add in the uh, Department of Just, Justice's antitrust division. I'd also add in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which you know just implemented an incredible late fees rule that'll save Americans billions of dollars a year uh, on late fees that are totally unjustifiable. Um, so... Look, I think they're doing an excellent job. I think it's going to take a lot more time to roll back, uh, you know, uh, so much of what's transpired in, in a more lax regulatory environment over the last, you know, 40 to 50 years, and in some cases longer. Um, but I think they're on the right track. Uh, as far as, you know, um, uh, you know, you know, as far as uh, the election. Uh, I'm not worried about the election. You know, I, you know, simply, uh, you know, during the yeah. Trump years, he chose people to, to, to head up these organizations. You got to assume he's going to get the old gang back again. Would those folks do any of this stuff that's moving us in the right direction? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, and, uh, and you know, I, I think corporate capture is real. And, you know, when, when these agencies are headed up uh, by people who, you know, um, put the interests of corporations ahead of the public, uh, you get what you get. And so I'm thankful that, that that's not the position we're in now. Uh, and we have agencies that really do have the public interest at heart uh, when they set out and, uh, you know, make rules and regulations and uh, just make sure that uh, the game is fair. I'm right there with you. Bilal, I appreciate you taking some time for us, sharing your thoughts. Uh, as always, I appreciate the work that you guys do. Keep it up. Absolutely. Pleasure to join you. Take uh, Good stuff. Bilal Badoon, Director of Policy and Research there at the Groundwork Collaborative. I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, are we heading in the right direction? Do you think going after these big corporations, breaking some of this stuff up, undoing 40 years of neoliberalism is a good thing? I know I do, but I want to hear it. Rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Quick break. Right back. Stick around. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So a quick shout out to my buddy Randy Corrigan, uh, principal officer out in Teamsters Local 1932 out in San Bernardino. You may remember we talked to him last week uh, about the, uh, the the rally they were going to have in front of the NLRB, B, the NLRB building in California out in Los Angeles. Uh, and they had a big they had a big thing planned. Well, the NLRB reached out and said, "Hey, you know, let let's talk. Uh, let's sit down and, and work this out." And 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 you know, so they postponed the rally uh, in in lieu of you know what these talks could bring. This is the power of direct action. Now, when people are getting out in the streets and exercising their power, when workers realize and exercise their power, good things happen. Uh, so I'm I'm excited to see what comes out of these these conversations and look you know maybe maybe there's a rally coming I always love a good rally uh, anyway here to share some thoughts on the top news of labor this week I've asked our good friend Michael Sonato to come talk with us he's one of the best labor reporters in the country uh, does some reporting over at the Guardian U.S. Uh, someone I follow quite quite often Michael thanks for taking time for us thanks for having me so uh, you know. There's so much going on. The UAW's historic victory. Uh, that I, a lot of people are talking about. This is going to open up the South. We're going to organize the South. Uh, what are you hearing? Uh, it's definitely a big sea change of you know what's going on. Um, you know, ten years ago, uh, you know, like they they lost their two last big elections, 2014, 2019, and this one was a blowout, 73 percent. Uh, right around there. Uh, 
and it, it, just watching the, the UAW now, it's not just Sean Fain. It's the, you know, the tactics. As soon as Volkswagen started um, doing their union busting, they filed a, a ULP charge and they were, you know, very aggressive and adamant about if you're going to union bust, we're going to go to the public. We're going to go to the press. We're going to scream our heads off about it because you're violating the law. Um, and th- that Volkswagen really pulled back. Mercedes is uh, doing uh, it a little bit uh, more, but still, uh, you know, they're you know pushing uh, against that. And I- I've seen that with um, you know the Amazon workers in the and in Kentucky uh, with their NLRB. So I- I've been seeing unions do. It used to be like a union would file a ULP charge. You never really hear about it. They there wouldn't be media coverage. Uh, and it, it would just take like a year until, you know, that got either settled or uh, the National Labor Relations Board made a ruling. So I, I think that's a different welcome tactic to, um, you know, people smartening up and being exposed to, oh, this is what uh, union busters and anti-union people say. Uh, and I, I think we're seeing the result of, uh, you know, people not being swayed and uh, that fear and intimidation not working because, um, the, the labor movement has kind of exposed these things to the mainstream. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's a big sea change. Uh, you know, we had governors um, throughout the South, uh, vote, you know, wrote a letter trying to scare workers into saying, don't, don't unionize, didn't work. Uh, and, you know, years ago, uh, that would have been, uh, no, it did work. But I would also argue, Michael, and I, I got to throw in there, I think a lot of this energy comes because Joe Biden is in the White House, uh, because you've got an NLRB that's willing to listen. Uh, you've got an NLRB that's that's helping elections move along at a quicker pace. And look, uh, this is why my buddy out in California is saying, look, we're going to protest the NLRB because they're going to listen and we can push them along to start making some of those decisions a little bit quicker because that was their complaint. How long does it take to get these people who have been unjustly fired back to work? How long has it come to, to come up with, with decisions on this stuff? And if we've got a more responsive NLRB who who is there to do the, the work of the, the mission of the organization, then we've got opportunities to organize, I think. No, absolutely. Because, you know, even under Obama, that really wasn't the case. You nope. didn't have, and you know, uh, people can, um, you know, criticize and want more from, from Joe Biden. But the fact that, you know, you do have, a president and a national labor relations board. You do have, you know, the, I, you know, I was uh, a couple of weeks ago, I listened to Jennifer Abruzzo, uh, the general counsel for the NLRB, uh, vocally uh, respond to Amazon and SpaceX and Starbucks, all uh, saying, claiming that the NLRB is unconstitutional. Uh, you, you know, you have those people, you know, Julie Sue is on, you know, you look at her Twitter, she's um, saying things that are very pro-union, they're very active. Uh, all those things, I think, come together. Um, you know, that fear dissipates. It's hard to, to gauge how much that is. But, um, you know, when, when you have the um, authority figures um, kind of highlighting and signaling, like, no, you have the right to do this. And, uh, you know, it kind of uh, under, undermines the ability of other power structures to instill fear, fear in workers. No, I mean, look, I've said for years, if, if I were advising a company a company of how to bre- break a union campaign, first thing you do is you fire somebody because the penalties for firing someone are so, so pathetic and meager that it, it would be political malpractice not to. And under an old NLRB who would keep someone out, you know, two, three years and this fight would just take on and on and on, you know, there was no downside to it. Uh, now, do we need major comprehensive labor law reform? Absolutely. We need to put some more more teeth in this law so that when they do f- fire someone illegally, they get bitten in the behind. Uh, but, you know, right now, I think what they're doing at the NLRB is, is moving us in the right direction. And oh, for my red hat friends. Yeah, Joe Biden did that. No, I, I, I agree. Um, and yeah, there, there's a lot more that needs to be done, but uh, it's a change of pace that you know, the past few years and, um, you know, yeah. it will continue if he's, you know, reelected. Um, and the just, energy that you've seen come out of this campaign, I think is going to be contagious. And I'm, I'm hope is going to, I hope is going to be that, that spark that's, that just sets the South on fire with organizing. 
Uh, I, I got to get some of your thoughts on what's going on at Starbucks. I, I know that, and I, I mean, shocked to me that Starbucks is going to sit to, is sitting down and supposedly negotiating. Uh, but what's going on there? I, I haven't heard a lot recently. Uh, what's going on? Uh, uh, both sides have kind of kept it under wraps about you know what's going on, and it really does poke holes. And you know, Starbucks throughout it claimed they were bargaining in good faith. So. Uh, you know, obviously they weren't if there's a new framework that they're actually going to sit down and bargain with. But uh, I, I think that comes with uh, just the courage and, and bravery of, of workers uh, within the Starbucks campaign. And, you know, at different Starbucks that continued to push, continued to file, uh, you know, the firings, the intimidation, the union busting certainly had a chilling effect, but um, it didn't defeat them. And, um I think Starbucks, you know, they had to give up to, to some extent, but, um, you know, they still are fighting um, cases at the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, they This week, they were hearing their case related to the Memphis 7 and the Supreme Court, uh, given the makeup of the Supreme Court. Uh, and the arguments uh, made this week, it seems like the Supreme Court's going to rule in their favor. Uh to, and that has to do with uh, 10J injunctions, uh, get, ordering um, fired workers to be to be reinstated, which is what happened uh, in Memphis, um, even though the board has pointed out that it doesn't matter what the two prong or the four prong, uh, you know, they've had similar outcomes. It's not like that, you know, Starbucks acts like the NLRB is just rubber stamping, uh, getting um fired workers reinstated when that's not really the case and well if you're uh, firing someone for you know concerted activities yeah they should rubber stamp it it should be the next day you go back to work um you know and and you know my problem with a lot of these firings is you know you make up nonsense uh because we live in a country where you don't have a right to a job you're an at-will employee so corporate america goes i don't need a reason to fire i just there's the door uh, and in these cases, I'm glad the NLRB is 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 being a little more uh, difficult in allowing them to fire people. Yeah, as they should, because I think uh, around 30 to 40 Starbucks workers have gotten that reinstatement ordered. Um, and, you know, I think the, the union said, like, it's around over 200 workers. A lot of those workers, you know, uh, just didn't file unfair labor practice charges because it's a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of time and it could take, uh, you know, this happened with, with the Memphis 7. This happened years ago. The, the workers are still working there and Starbucks is still fighting it in the Supreme Court. So there, there's, there's Starbucks workers making drinks right now in Memphis uh, related to this case that Starbucks still wants to fire, even though they've been reinstated and still there for over a year. It's just, it's just ridiculous. Well, do you think that's part of the push by, you know, the Amazons, by the, uh, the, you know, the Teslas, by, uh, the, the Starbucks, the Trader Joe's who want to have the, uh, NLRA ruled unconstitutional and thus throwing, you know, labor relations in this country into, into chaos. Do you think this is a part of that? Absolutely. They want to undermine that their how weak labor law is, the little power that they do have. They don't want to listen to it. That's why they're, they they appeal. They delay. They fight. They've never said, oh, we screwed up. Oh, we, we didn't mean to. Oh, we actually did union bus. Like, it's never been done uh, with all these companies. But we know Amazon, Starbucks, Trader Joe's, they've all done it. Uh, they've egregiously disgustingly uh they've hurt their own workers uh it, it's it's uh, definitely a part of that they don't want to be told uh you know what to do uh and they don't want to uphold workers rights to, to organize they do not respect that howard schultz doesn't uh jeff bezos and his uh, now you know andy jassy they don't um amazon is still fighting you know i, I think later this month uh, the Alabama second rerun election is finally the objections to that are going to be adjudicated. Um, so, you know, they still haven't bargained with JFK 8, the one warehouse in the U.S. to uh, have unionized. That is a failure of labor law. That is ridiculous. Workers shouldn't have to wait 
over two years and not have one bargaining session. This is why I keep uh, coming back to, you know, one of the things I liked about the Employee Free Choice Act is it tripled the fees, the fines for illegally firing someone, but it mandated a, a first contract. And there was a time schedule at which you had to get that first contract because corporate America, even if you do win uh, the election, if you win the vote, it doesn't mean necessarily you're going to get a contract. And I look at, you know, at the UAW and Volkswagen, uh, I think with a 73% win, I think it's going to make it a lot easier. And with it being a German company and the laws that they have in Germany, going to be a lot easier. But, you know, it, it's not assured. And that that is a it's just a failure of labor law yep. uh, it's a you know broken part of labor law uh, it, you know it, it should be uh companies can just say oh we're bargaining in good faith and not actually do it like starbucks had been doing um and the only uh power workers have is to can you know but what starbucks workers did they held strikes they held uh you know they pushed they had, you know campaigns and different things around like red cup day and things like that um pushing um investors and shareholders and kind of um you know i think a big thing right before starbucks turned was they were pushing uh, investors to show, reveal how much money you're actually paying Littler Mendelssohn and these union avoidance consultants. Um, how many millions of dollars are you throwing away? Um, and that's ultimately hurting shareholders because that would either go back in the business of Starbucks or could go to shareholders, dividends, or, or could go to improving wages. But you know, they have millions of dollars to spend on this. Um, so see, see, here's, it, it, here's where I, I make the argument a little differently. Um, you know, I don't think the shareholders care how much they're spending on union busting because the argument you make to it is, hey, if we can cheat those workers out of wages and, and health care retirement and all that stuff, if we can cheat them out of any any say on the job and ensure that we can have complete dictatorial control over wages, hours, conditions, it's going to it's going to make you more money. So you shouldn't care how much we spend on on union busting and abusing our workforce because they're going to make you more profit by not demanding higher wages. That's the argument I think that they make. Yeah, I uh, no, I completely agree with that. Yeah. But and I, I want them to make I, that there, argument, there is, Michael. Yeah. I want them to make that argument. I want them to say that out loud because it's what yeah. they believe. Unless you're a CEO, then you get uh, wage increases, even if they're, <laughs> your company is losing money. Yeah, yeah. everyone's got a golden parachute. Uh, finally, I got to get your thoughts on this coming Sunday, April 28th, is International Workers Memorial Day. That's the day that those of us who have had friends and loved ones killed on the job, uh, where we remember them. And, and, and then hopefully uh, you'll want to do something better in the future to make sure workplaces are safer, to make sure that people are held accountable. But sadly, um, I don't see much changing in the way of, of protecting workers the way I would like to, the, to see it. Uh, but I agree with Mother Jones. We mourn the dead. We fight like hell for the living. I wanted to get your thoughts. Um, you've been doing some really good reporting around this. Uh, what do you see? I see uh, in OSHA agency that's underfunded, uh, the budget for the agency's not been keeping up uh, just over the past decade. Uh, there's been legislation to modernize it, to expand it, because a lot of states uh, don't have their own OSHAs, which certainly aren't you know up to standard. Uh, you know, and you have you know government employees that aren't covered. You have uh, swaths of, of workers who aren't covered by OSHA, and and then you have. Um, you know, basic protections like heat protections that workers every summer, there's, you know, I do stories, there's stories of, you know, workers dying in heat. Uh, you know, it's just basic protections they need, water, rust, shade, breaks, uh, not expensive at all, but you have uh, trade groups, industrial groups uh, fighting tooth and nail. Uh, you know, uh, they passed a, the, a bill in DeSantis in Florida, here in Florida, uh, banning any uh, cities from passing heat protection laws because Miami-Dade County was uh, on the path to do that. Uh, and it's just you know, disgusting. You know, people don't think about how, um, you know, you know. I know safety isn't as, uh, you know, sexy as uh, organizing and winning and all those things, but it's, it's like a really important part. You know, every worker um, deserves to be able to go home at the end of the day to their families. Uh, you know, none of the, all these deaths are preventable. 
uh, there's and you know many of these stories just aren't told. They're just lost in the data of OSHA. You know, over five thousand workers that just we know it, that's reported die in the U.S. every year on the job from you know things like falls, transportation incidents. Uh, you know, killed in all sorts of um, you know disgusting ways that are uh, avoidable. And you know, I've covered it. You know, you've seen it. Just OSHA. Um, they just give a little fine and the employers back to profiting it and, you know, making millions. And, uh, you know, a lot of these companies are continuing to violate, um, you know, workers rights to, uh, a safe work workplace. So and, and educating people and getting people aware of like what these dangers are, what these hazards are, um, and you know, how to prevent them and why and how employers don't do that. Uh, is just an ongoing uh, challenge. Uh, it's it's amazing to me, and I get the uh, the uh, the newsletters every every day, and the uh, the press releases from the OSHA uh, subscription service, and it's amazing to me how little some of these fines are, and how uh, how much you know you know. And it's by statute. It's not because OSHA says, "Oh, well, we're gonna we're, we've decided that we're gonna we're gonna you know give you know ten thousand dollars or whatever in fines." Uh, it's because the laws are written so badly. Uh, that protect corporations, and I've always said, Michael, if I if I really wanted to kill somebody, I would just give them a job, because I don't know that we ever prosecute people who you know have conditions where people die on the job. But you know, here's where we are. So Sunday, Workers Memorial Day. I hope we, uh, I hope we have at least the moment to think about uh, the workers who have lost their lives on the job. But Michael Sonato, appreciate the time, man. Yeah, you know, thanks for having me again. Uh, Michael Sonato, I got to tell you, one of the best labor reporters in the country. Make sure you check out his work over at The Guardian. Gonna take a quick break. Right back. Stick around. This is The Rick Smith Show. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1978. That was the day of an important victory for any woman in the United States with a pension. The Supreme Court handed down its decision in a case known as Los Angeles Water Department versus Manhart. Manhart and a group of current and past female employees at the department had sued. The women were required to pay more into their pension than were the men. The reason for this policy was that women lived longer on average. That meant that the 2,000 women employed at the water department had to contribute nearly 15% more than their 10,000 male co-workers. The women argued that this violated Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which prohibited discrimination based on gender. The case wound its way through the court system. The ACLU filed a brief in support of the women's cause at the U.S. Supreme Court. The women won their case in a 6-2 decision. The majority of justices decided that even if women lived longer than men as a group, it would be impossible to know how long each individual woman might live. Therefore, individual women could not be held to a different standard for their pensions. The case was an important affirmation of the protections of the Civil Rights Act. Yet despite this victory, the women were not returned any of the extra money they had been required to pay into their pensions. Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens, writing for the majority, found that such retroactive payments could be, quote, devastating for a pension fund. He wrote that, quote, administrators of retirement plans must be given time to adjust gradually to Title VII's demands. Labor History in Two, brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. Welcome back to The Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So again, Sunday... The 28th of April, it will be Workers Memorial Day. And uh, look, this is one of those days, you know, for me anyway, because I've known several people over the years who have died at work. And and it's 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 tragic. It's it's harmful for the families. Uh, it's it's it tears apart uh, the workforce. Uh, you know, it's it, nothing good in this. Uh, and look, I, I got to think on a certain level, it hurts. It hurts corporations as well. 
Uh, now, you know, the, the reality is, is we've done a really poor job over the years uh, of uh, the last several years of protecting workers. Uh, what OSHA had done in the beginning, uh, you know, stopping lots of deaths, uh, lots of injuries. You know, we're in a moment and I, I saw this this study not too long ago. Uh, that pointed out that we're, you know, we're at like a 45 year low. This was back in 2020, a 45 year low of the number of inspectors who are on the job at OSHA. Uh, they, they said that, you know, in 2020, there were 862 inspectors, uh, which is down from 952 in 2016 and 1,006 in 2012. And look, you know, the Reagan era gutted all of that stuff because it really was about gutting regulatory oversight it really was about gutting uh the 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 guardrails of capitalism it was really about gutting those protections for workers because we got job killing regulations uh what i found interesting to uh inspect every workplace in this country uh under osha's purview would take 165 years so the reality is it's a reactive organization, not proactive, like I would like it to be. I would like people not to die on the job. That's that's kind of what we want. Uh, what I found interesting is, you remember when DeSantis signed that bill, that preemption bill that said, hey, Miami, uh, no, you can't protect workers in your community, uh, that the that OSHA had released a, uh, a statement that uh, they had fined a corporation because a 26 year old guy who had come here from Mexico to work in South Florida, uh, worked four days, died on the job from heat related injuries. And you know, you go down the list of you know, all of the failures and all of the things that happened and you get to the, the punchline, which is this McNeil labor management. Uh, they face a maximum penalty of, of 27,655 bucks, an amount set by federal statute. To highlight just what I said, look, you know, the reality is the laws have been written in a way to, well, protect corporate interests at the expense of working people. Now, look, OSHA is important. Uh, we need to ensure work safe workplaces. We need to prevent workplace illnesses and injuries. Uh, we need to help promote mental health. We need to protect vulnerable workers. We need to be doing all of those things so that when you go home at the end of the day, you go home in the same condition you showed up in. Because at the, after all, we work to live, not live to work. But from a corporate perspective, from the business perspective, you want what comes out of safer workplaces, which is improve productivity, uh, reduce in health care costs, happy workers, and oh, by the way, growth. If you've got happy workers and more productive workers, you've got more stuff done. And it's always been amazing to me that employers don't get that. That, you know, butting heads with their workforce or, or illegally firing people for no reason, you know, I, it doesn't create a great environment. And this is one of those those moments where you go, hey, uh, we can fix this stuff. We can create safe work environments so people want to go to work and want to do their best and not have to worry about, hey, am I going to make it home tonight? Now, do, accidents do happen, uh, but most of them are preventable. And this is where having a proactive OSHA uh, instead of a reactive OSHA would be helpful. Uh, this is where having a little more responsibility put on the employers, I don't know, a little helpful. But all we hear from, from Republicans is, you know, job killing regulations. Uh, we, need to, we need to cut and gut. And it's what they've done over the last 40 years. And OSHA is just one of the many organizations uh, that have seen massive cuts over the years. KCAA. The Federal Communications Commission is voting to restore net neutrality rules. Lisa Taylor explains. The rules block broadband providers from stopping Internet traffic to some websites and speeding up access to sites that pay extra fees. The FCC chair said the pandemic